and we're very, very pleased to welcome back Aidan Rominger, who's a young birdwatcher and naturalist from uh, Indiana in the States. Um, he's joining us from there this evening uh, to talk about the birds of Indiana, and he'll be doing a, a seasonal review, very comprehensive one at that, of all the birds that uh, he's managed to, to see in Indiana, which is pretty well all of them. Um, Aiden is born and bred in Indianapolis, um, and uh, he's got a degree in uh, uh, <clears throat> wildlife conservation, which took him on uh, also with the aid of ringing experience to his present job, which is as head ornithologist and naturalist at the Indiana Ornithology Center at Eagle Creek, which is a remarkable city park uh, in part of Indianapolis, 5,000 acres, I think, of water and forest, uh, which is used as an education center and a conservation center. Um, it's partly city funded and partly funded by various Audubon societies that do such good works throughout the states. Well, Aidan is the natural uh, naturalist and communicator for such a job. He's known the site since he was about six years old. Um, and he knows all its comings and goings of birds. And it is quite a remarkable treasure house of the state's uh, ornithology. Um, so we're in great hands this evening. Uh, and I'm sure you'll quickly realize, as, realize he's a great communicator. Part of his job is spreading the word about ornithology and natural history to as wide a range of people as possible, including youngsters. He organized various birding festivals throughout the year and uh, focused talks and walks within uh, the Eagle Creek uh, Park. Um, so I'm, I'm sure and I hope he's going to treat us as one of his special interest groups uh, this evening. Um, and we now look forward to his presentation on birds in Indiana. Thank you, Aidan, for joining us this evening. Well, it's not evening for you. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. You're speaking to us from home this time. We really appreciate your time this evening. And I'm sure you're going to get the program off to a great start. Thank you, over to you. Thank you so much, Nigel. Can you hear me all right? Yep, sure can. All right, so um, thank you so much for that amazing intro. Um, I just wanted to start with this first slide tonight. Um, it is a flock of evening grosbeaks and a little fun fact about evening grosbeaks. Um, this species of grosbeak used to be one of the most common species of birds in the winter in Indiana. Um, but their population, especially the eastern population, has declined um, by over 90% um, in the past 10 years, um, which is very uh, alarming. Um, but they equate that to loss of um, trees in the boreal forest in Canada. Um, but I was lucky enough about last year to visit a feeder set up in southern Indiana um, where there is a flock of over 175 evening gross beaks. Um, and this is just a few of those um, wonderful special birds, but they are truly a trademark historical species of Indiana. And I felt like it was very fitting um, to put this as the title slide for that. So I wanted to start off um, a little bit about myself. So um, I grew up in Indianapolis and I'm currently still living there. For the time being, um, I started seriously birding at age 11, um, but I've had an interest in birds since I was a toddler. Um, in 2014, I became the youngest person at age 14 to see over 300 species of birds in one year in Indiana um, during my statewide big year. Um, and that was a true accomplishment thanks to many birding friends of mine. Um, I was not driving at the time, so that was very difficult, but um, I managed to do it, which was awesome. Um, I graduated from Purdue University in 2022 with a degree in wildlife biology. Um, I worked for Purdue's hardwood ecosystem experiment, uh, conducting breeding bird surveys throughout the Hoosier National Forest, um, and that is in southern Indiana. Um, I ended up actually finding uh, four new species that had never been found on the count there. Uh, those species were ruffed grouse, a black bow cuckoo, uh, blue-headed vireo, and I believe rose-breasted grosbeak had not been recorded down there. So that was pretty exciting. Um, and then I also recently helped um, catch and ring both seaside sparrows, painted buntings, 
um, on Kiwa Island, South Carolina, um, as well as northern Sawat owls in northern Indiana. Um, and there's a picture of me holding a yeah, northern Sawat owl um, during one of the research banding projects that I was a part of at Purdue. Um, and then more recently, in 2022, I led birding tours in Kiwa Island, South Carolina, um, and actually ended up finding three new species for the island while I was there, um, which were a great cormorant, Glaucus gull, and roseate tern. Um, so pretty awesome species to add to South Carolina. Um, and I was only there for a summer, but I'd been vacationing there for many years. So that was quite exciting for me um, to get to be able to do that. Um, but moving right along. So some Indiana bird statistics. So there are roughly up to date 422 species of birds that have been recorded in Indiana. Um, with that, 47 waterfowl species, 47 shorebird species, six hummingbird species, 19 gull species, 27 raptor species, and the list goes on and on. Uh, but throughout this presentation, I will basically go through each season and discuss the species that occur during each season, or a typical birder like myself would focus on um, throughout our typical seasons. So in green, I will have nesting species. Um, in orange, I will have species. And then white will be annual species um, as we go through this. Um, and then, of course, one of my favorite sparrows that we get every fall um, in early spring, a Leconte sparrow. Um, this was a photograph I got. Loved the pose that it made with that spike tail. Um, but they're just gorgeous uh, little sparrows. They usually keep very hidden in um, kind of wet um, grassland areas. But um, I saw that in the northern region of the state with that. Without further ado, we will get started to our first season. So winter birding. So I'm chunking this out. Winter is December through March. So we'll be going through all the species we can see in Indiana um, in that time frame. So in the winter, um, target species include um, waterfowl, so ducks, geese, swans, grebes, and loons. Um, raptors, um, we have seven species of raptors, uh, excuse me, seven species of hawk, one species of harrier, two species of eagle. Um, owls, we have nine species of owls that have been recorded in Indiana. Um, gulls, 18 species of gulls in the winter. Um, sparrows and towhees, about 24 species of sparrow, three species of towhee, and finches, about 10 species of finch will be going over. Um, and this was a picture of a flock of red poles, um, and the middle one actually happens to be a hoary red pole. Um, whether or not this will be split or not down the line um, by um, taxonomic societies that is to be determined, but for now it is a separate species along with a flock of common red poles. Um, and just kind of always see those birds in the winter, so I figured it was appropriate winter photo for, for the slide. So we'll get right along into our waterfowl um, and winter waterfowl. So we'll start with some dabbling duck species that have occurred in Indiana. So 12 species of dabbling ducks have occurred in Indiana, uh, four of which nest in the state. This includes wood duck, um, green winged teal, um, excuse me, wood duck, blue winged teal, northern shoveler, and mallard are the four species that nest in the state. Uh, the others our green winged teal, um, cinnamon teal, Eurasian wigeon, gadwall, um, American wigeon, American black duck, mottled duck, and northern pintail. Um, and a little interesting tidbit about uh, the mottled duck. So the mottled duck is the duck pictured on the lower right hand side of the screen. Uh, mottled duck has actually been recorded in the state roughly three or four times. And this is a species that is typically only restricted to the southeastern coastal states um, of the U.S. So very unprecedented, um, but we have had a few records of that. Um, there was a couple records 
of one in a random flock of over 250 mallards um, in the middle of January. And you have to wonder what a salt marsh duck is doing in the middle of January in Indiana um, in a flock of mallards, but it has occurred and has happened before. So pretty incredible stuff. Um, and then we have our beautiful, elegant wood duck. Um, this is a large photo here on the left. That is a male. Um, and I photographed that bird just down the street from one of my um, favorite birding spots um, at Eagle Creek. Um, there's this kind of wet uh, forest habitat and they always love to um, hang out in there. Um, and they're actually, they nest nearby um, as well in cavities. They are cavity nesters similar to the mandarin duck, um, but absolutely, absolutely gorgeous species. Um, never get tired of those. And then of course we have the classic Northern shoveler um, on the top. Um, right hand side of the screen and that is just a beautiful drake that was posing for me quite well usually they do not let me get too close but this bird was very obliging acting like some of the park mallards um, so that was quite nice to be able to see moving right along to a couple more um, dabbling duck pictures here so on the right side of the screen we have a eel um, and that was a male cinnamon teal that was um, showed up in northern Indiana at a place called Kankakee um, River Bottoms. And that was around, oh, I think that was around March of this year. Um, but it was, um, I just, I liked that shot, even though it wasn't the most detailed shot in the world. It showed all the beautiful markings of um, the wing um, and that beautiful, rich orange tone of that um, duck. Very unique species um, um, of teal, um, native to America only, cinnamon teals are, and uh, they kind of have a hybrid bill almost from a shoveler and a mallard. They just kind of have like, if you mix those two bill shapes together, that's what you get with the cinnamon teal. Um, then the, we are moving on to the bottom um, left-hand corner of the screen. We have a pair of blue-winged teal. Um, these are very common spring um, dabbling ducks in Indiana, uh, probably the most common um, sign of early spring is seeing blue-winged teal on the local pond. Um, but these guys are always a treat to see, absolutely gorgeous um, ducks with those crescent pattern on the face, um, gray head, and beautiful flank spotting, um, as well as a female, kind of less regal, but also gorgeous in appearance. Um, and then above that photo of the teal, we have a female wood duck actually at that location I was previously talking about on a nest or potential past nest because this was in the winter uh, but it was a cavity um, and they will nest extremely high up in trees um, shockingly it's hence the name tree ducks um, but I assume that that was a past cavity that it was um, on so that was quite cool for that and we'll move right along from the dabbling ducks to the diving ducks. And these are my personal favorite um, group of ducks, if I had to pick. Um, so we have about 17 species of diving ducks um, in Indiana, four species of diving ducks that nest in the state. Um, those nesting species include common merganser, hooded merganser, um, redhead, and ruddy duck. And the common merganser is basically the same thing as um, the goosander. They are split, um, but very anatomically similar birds um, look very similar. Um, and the common merganser nesting record actually just came very recently. Um, that is a species that um, historically is a northern nester. They nest kind of in the boreal forest on forest streams, but um, recently have been found to nest in some of the creek streams in Indiana. Um, and that was a very new find. So that was pretty amazing to uncover that. Um, but pictured here, um, we have a lovely, beautiful um, Drake Harlequin duck. Um, and you can see the list of diving ducks we've also had here. Um, so we've had a number of uh, scoter species, so long, um, excuse me, black scoter, white winged scoter, and surf scoter. And Harlequin duck is another one of those kind of bay ducks that we've had um, along with one species of eider, king eider. Um, but this beautiful harlequin duck was um, kind of the start of the show in the winter 
on the lake shore of Indian, Indiana, um, at the Indiana Dunes, um, there was a little um, jetty where there was a Drake Harlequin duck, and it stayed there for about a week. Um, so I jumped at the chance of going to see it, and I had never actually seen an adult um, male. I'd seen females before, but never an adult male. And um, man, what a gorgeous bird. Um, these are fascinating birds. So Harlequin ducks have some of the most unbelievable um, migrations of any diving duck in my opinion. So they migrate through Indiana um, in the winter, but in the summer, they, um, they, well, in the winter months, there's two populations. So there's the Pacific population of Harlequin ducks that will migrate down the um, Pacific shore from Northern Canada down to California. Um, and kind of be along the coast there. And then we have the eastern population that um, nests kind of in some of the mountain streams um, in um, the western Rockies and actually migrate over eastward to the eastern Atlantic um, as well as the um, Indiana and Midwestern states. So Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, and Illinois um, get to see them in the winter months. But they nest in these mountain streams in the Rocky Mountains and end up on the Great Lakes or on the Atlantic Ocean in the winter. It's just incredible, um, incredible birds. Um, they probably have seen some beautiful sights in their time. Um, so that's the Harlequin. And then moving on from that, on the upper right-hand side of the screen, we have a surf scoter on the bottom. And on the top, we have a uh, female or immature male, hard to know, um, black scooter, um, pretty common probably out there in Europe. And then, um, well, I guess you guys probably won't have black scooters. You will have common scooters. Um, but below that, we have a white wing scooter. Um, so kind of similar to the Sting Stingner scooter. I can't really say that right. And the velvet scooter, um, but a little bit different. Um, and bill coloration and overall head shape, um, but absolutely gorgeous ducks. Um, all winter residents again, um, but mostly restricted to the lakeshore. Um, the park I work at, Eagle Creek, has had all three um, Indiana scoters at it as well, but that's kind of one of the only exceptions inland to many scoter numbers for that. Moving right along to more diving ducks. The biggest picture here on the left side is a Drake longtail duck. Um, this is a very regal, beautiful duck. Um, and we don't often get too many, but we will get a couple of them inland in Indiana in the winter, um, migrating southward from their breeding grounds in northern Canada, um, as well as redhead. Uh, it's kind of common apia species of duck. Um, this is the top. Um, right hand side of the photo there, a um, flock of redhead. And then below the redhead, we have a beautiful um, Barrows Golden Eye. Um, and this is a third uh, record for Indiana. We have actually not had a Barrows Golden Eye in, I believe, over nine or 10 years in the state. But they have occurred in Indiana um, in large flocks of common Golden Eye. Um, but I figured I'd put it in there just because you know we've had them before and maybe it's putting out to the bird another bear's gold and I hopefully just need um, for that. Moving right along to geese. So Indiana has about seven species of geese um, and one of which breeds in Indiana. Um, Canada goose of course is one of the most common geese species in North America. That is the one goose species that breeds in Indiana. The rest of them do not. Um, so other species that we've had are cackling geese, um, brant, just the eastern brant, so the pale-bellied brant, greater white-fronted geese, snow geese, Ross's geese, and pink-footed goose. Um, and the really interesting on that pink-footed goose record, so um, about I think it was in the 1980s, um, a hunter shot a pink-footed goose in a flock of Canada geese. And of course, we have not had one since. So that is our only record of a pink-footed goose in Indiana. 
Um, although uh, this past year, I actually got to see a pink-footed goose um, in Kentucky, not too far from the border of Indiana. Um, so technically not in Indiana, but um, I at least got to see one in the Midwest, so kind of made up for it. Um, but looking at the images here, so on the left-hand side, we have a huge flock of at least, I would estimate, 65 to 70,000 greater white. Um, this is a zoomed in image of a absolutely full, humongous flock of geese, uh, literally darkening the skies in size. Um, this is at a place called Universal Strip Mines on the western side of the state that every winter gets um, thousands of geese, uh, mostly greater white fronted. They also get pretty large numbers of snow geese, uh, but mostly greater white fronted geese. Um, and these are all the Canadian population um, migrating kind of southward um, through the state in the winter. Then to the top right hand photo, we have a Ross's goose with a couple Canada geese there. Um, this is a bird that I found just outside of Eagle Creek. Um, and oddly enough, Ross's geese resemble visually snow geese, um, although they have um, petite they have smaller bill, smaller gape in the bill, um, typically just smaller size overall. Um, but almost all the times I've ever found a Ross goose, they've never been associating with snow geese. They've been associating with Canada geese. Um, and that's only when it's one individual. When it's more than one, you'll see them in mixed flocks of snow geese. But typically, if it's one Ross's goose, I have found that they love to associate with Canada geese. I don't know why that is. It's very strange. Snow geese tend not to do that, but it seems um, Ross's geese do. So very interesting tidbit about that. And then right under it is a pale-bellied brant. This is a rare bird for Indiana. Um, they are typical coastal migrants along the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. Um, this is a pale-bellied brant. This bird absolutely came from the Atlantic coast. Um, in Indiana tends to get a couple records every couple of years of that species. This is an individual at a very unfortunate location um, on the side of a highway um, in a very strange out of pocket place with a couple of um, Canada geese. Um, but this bird unfortunately had a pretty sad ending. It ended up about two days after I took that photo, sadly getting hit by a car. Um, and that beautiful specimen of that bird actually was donated to the university that I worked at um, as a research specimen. So at least it was not in um, total um, loss. Um, so we are continuing its legacy through education. So there is that. There is a silver lining to that story. Moving right along to swans. So there are three species of swans that have occurred in Indiana. Two species breed in the state. Um, this includes trumpeter swans and mute swans. Mute swans should be a pretty familiar um, species of swan out in Europe. Um, originally native to Europe, they are actually pretty invasive in North America. They have spread basically to every single North American state, um, but unfortunately have colonized Indiana. I'm not a personal fan of mute swans, although they are somewhat elegant species. Um, they tend to bother a lot of native waterfowl nesting species and kind of push them um, out of really nice nesting habitat. So not a great conservation of species, but we do have them. Um, the large photo on the left-hand side is a flock of tundra swans flying over the moon. Um, I really like this image. I took this actually when I was quite young. Um, and uh, again, I believe that was at Kankakee, um, same place that I um, had multiple waterfowl um, in years past in the winter. Um, and then the corner right, bottom right image are two trumpeter swans, um, a conservation success species. This species used to be endangered throughout much of North America, but has since um, increased in population to a very stable number similar to the bald eagle, um, and is now nesting in multiple locations in Indiana, which is pretty amazing. Um, considering they used to only nest in northwestern United States. So pretty incredible bird um, to be able to have in Indiana for sure. 
moving on to our loons or divers. Um, I figured I'd add that because out here we call them uh, loons, but in Europe they are divers. We have about four species of loon that have occurred in Indiana, um, but zero species breed in the state. Um, most uh, loon species are northern um, nesters, so kind of um, and upward north. Um, so this common loon, red throated loon, Pacific loon, and yellow billed loon. Um, believe it or not, there was a um, in the state um, years ago. Um, I have not seen one in the state. I'd love to see one, um, but have not seen one yet. So still waiting on that one. Um, the photo on the left hand side is a beautiful uh, winter plumage red throated loon. Um, I got the chance to photograph that same place I photographed the harlequin duck, um, but different times. That was at Portage Lakefront Park on the lakefront, so of Lake Michigan. Um, and then top right hand image is of a Pacific loon. Um, I actually kayaked out to that bird and that I was recently sold. Um, it wasn't the best kayak because I ended up, it was freezing. Um, there was kind of a windstorm at the time. I decided to go out there crazily, try to get close and photograph this bird. Never let me get too close. Um, but I noticed halfway through paddling through that bird that there was a hole in my kayak and there was water filling into the kayak. So I quickly took that shot, started hurling it to the shore, um, which was about a, a quarter mile or about a quarter mile away um, on this lake, but I made it, so I can tell the story now, but um, pretty awesome bird, Pacific loon there. Um, we get a few of those every year, not too common, um, but we do get them. And then we have um, on the bottom right-hand side, a common loon, again, hence the name, the most common loon species that we do get in Indiana, um, and that is a very common species that we'll see on most deep lakes um, or Lake Michigan in the spring and winter. Moving on to grebes. So there are four species of uh, grebe have occurred in Indiana, um, and that includes pied billed, um, horn grebe, ear grebe, and western grebe. And there's a little spelling error there. It should be grebe, but not loon. Uh, but pretty incredible um, list of grebes that we've had in Indiana. We've had pied billed grebe, Corn grebe, ear grebe, and western grebe. Um, and the right hand side is a photo of a western grebe that was photographed at the same harlequin duck um, at the same time. Being with the harlequin duck a little bit, which is kind of side by side, um, catching fish and whatnot. Um, but very large grebe, um, kind of. Probably I would estimate around Great Crested Grebe size, um, maybe a little bit larger, um, may, almost like red-necked Great Crested Grebe kind of size, um, a little bit taller, but beautiful, beautiful birds, um, mostly native to out in the interior west and along the Pacific coast. Um, and then the top um, left-hand corner is a eared grebe that was photographed at Eagle Creek. Um, a transitioning spring plume bird there. Um, so in the winter, they kind of have um, black and white plumage, but in the spring, um, they gain this beautiful or orange flanks and this black um, head with um, these yellow plumes on the side. Um, and I believe in Europe, it's called black necked grebe. So same, same bird, um, just in North. And then on the bottom left-hand side, we have a bill grebe probably the most common species of grebe that we get in Indiana, uh, but very unique looking grebe. Um, it's in its own genera, so very cool to see that um, for that. Moving right along to raptors. So this includes eagles, hawks, and harriers. Um, so we have about seven species of hawk that we can see in the winter months in Indiana. One species of harrier, two species of eagle, um, and about five species of raptor currently breed in the state. Um, so this includes northern harrier, Cooper's hawk, red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawk, and bald eagle. Um, and I suppose I could add osprey to that list. So 
that would make that to six species as well. Um, but ospreys are kind of a recent nester as well in the state, um, and as well with where they're not too common, but we do get them. Um, in terms of annual species, hawks, um, rough-legged hawks, and golden eagles um, as well. So um, on the right-hand side of the screen, we have a photo of a um, sub-adult, I guess, second golden eagle. Um, and this is at a known wintering location in northern Indiana um, called Jasper Pulaski. Um, there is a known group of about four to five golden eagles that hangs out in this random kind of agricultural fields, um, very flat terrain. There are large bodies of water with plenty of ducks um, and whatnot nearby. So I believe that's probably where they get their um, source of food during the cold winter months. But um, these are the Eastern um, Canadian Rockies population. So quite a cool population that migrates to the state and also winters in the state, Golden Eagle. Definitely one of my favorite birds, for sure. Um, and then the top left-hand photo is of an adult um, rough-legged hawk, um, light morph. We have two morphs, one's dark, one's light. That is a light morph. Um, they are winter-only raptor, probably our, one of our only winter-only raptors that we get in the state, um, next to northern goshawk. Goshawks are very, very rare. Um, I still have yet to see one of this, um, so still really wait, waiting on that one. Um, hopefully this is my year. Um, bottom of the rough legged is a northern harrier. So unlike in Europe, where you guys are lucky enough to have multiple species of harrier, we only have one, um, but a beautiful bird. Um, we do have them nesting, like I said, in grassland sections of the state. Uh, a lot of the national um, grasslands that we have. Um, in the northern, northwestern stage, they do nest. So a couple more raptors to show you here. So just photos So we have on the left-hand side, a red-shouldered hawk. Um, this is an early photograph. I took of one actually at my school. Uh, we had a pair of red-shouldered hawks that would hunt frogs in this little pond right next to um, my high school. And um, it was just screaming its head off one day and I brought my camera and I was really lucky enough to get that shot. Um, but absolutely beautiful raptor, um, bright orange raptor. And they differ all throughout North America, but the Eastern population is particularly buffy. Um, so that was really awesome to, to have those species. And we actually, at the ornithology center that I work at, we have a nest of these birds. Um, so it's amazing to see these birds nest and um, hunt frogs. And that's actually with their favorite snack. So primarily eating frogs and um, they can find snakes occasionally, um, but really cool raptor. And then on the top um, right hand side, we have a sharp shinned hawk, so similar to the sparrow hawk, a little um, different structurally, um, but very similar to sparrow hawk in Europe, um, but very cool bird, um, a winter only hawk. So that is, I guess, another winter species. And then below that, we have a red-tailed hawk, but you wouldn't think it because that is a Harlan's red-tailed hawk. Um, many taxonomists have thought about splitting this subspecies of red-tailed hawk, um, but they are all black. They don't have the traditional red tail that most red-tailed hawks have. Um, they have a white speckling on the breast there. Um, but beautiful bird. Um, I was to get to see that in southern Indiana um, in the winter years ago. All right. Moving right along to falcons. So five species of falcon occur in Indiana. Um, species of falcon breed in the state, so a decent amount. Uh, Merlin, peregrine falcon, and American kestrel are those breeding species, with prairie falcon and jeer falcon being the rarities that occasionally um, will raise uh, their presence in the winter months of this, um, in the northwestern or um, southwestern part of the state. So prairie falcons have been found on the strip mines in the southwestern part of the state. And Jeer falcon has been found in the northwestern uh, part of the state. Favorite birds um, on the right side of the screen, a absolutely gorgeous light morph Jeer falcon. Um, absolutely amazing bird. Uh, just seeing these birds, you know, we, I, this was in, um, 
This is a kind of cheated image from um, Illinois, so not quite Indiana, but um, they, this bird was hunting ducks over a frozen um, Lake Michigan, and it just barely missed this common merganser and then flew up to this tower, and I got that shot. Um, but we were actually, um, myself and another bird, last people to see this particular bird. We saw it take off the lake and unfortunately never to be seen again. So absolutely incredible experience with that bird. Um, and then a Merlin um, is the top left-hand screen there. Um, that is a breeding uh, Merlin that one of the first confirmed breeding records for Indianapolis was just um, confirmed last summer. Um, so that was my photograph of at the nesting site of that. Um, beautiful birds, love merlins, can never get old of them. Um, and we have a pair of peregrine falcons harassing a So unfortunately, right after that photo was taken, that juvenile peregrine falcon plucked that willet right up from the break wall and blew away with it. Um, but there was about six willet couple American avocets on that break wall and that peregrine swooped in at ridiculous speed, hit it and didn't quite get it the first time and then dove in that second time. Um, it, um, and it almost was like the adult was watching just to kind of see if the juvenile could actually do it and the juvenile pulled through. Um, so I love falcons, never, never get old, um, never get tired of the falcons. Owls. So moving straight along to owls. Um, so winter is really um, one of the best months in Indiana to see owls. Um, nine species of owls have occurred in Indiana. Um, four species breed in the state. So that includes barn owl, short-eared owl, long-eared owl, barred owl, eastern screech owl, and great horned owl, um, and burrowing owl. Um, and it's kind of disputed. Um, long-eared owls have potentially bred in the state, but it's not confirmed. Um, but uh, for sure, great horns, street barred, and barns have bred. Um, but on the left-hand side of the screen, we have beautiful um, American long-eared owl. So kind of different than the European long-eared from the um, European long-eared has those orange eyes, um, but the North American long-eareds, in my opinion, almost are almost more striking with those buffy, color throughout um, its plumage and those bright yellow eyes. Um, I, I could totally see those two being split someday, um, especially since Northern Gossok. Um, now American Gossok has been split from um, the European Gossok. I think that'd be a similar split someday if I could predict one. Um, but moving to the other photos, so the top right-hand side of the screen is one of the cutest owls in the world, a Northern Southwet Owl. Um, I had the fortune of banding these birds for uh, several years while I was in uh, college. Um, winter only species, um, but they have theoretically, again, bred in the state. Historically, um, not confirmed, uh, but I love those guys. Amazing and very fine. Um, they'll be perching in small uh, cedars, and they usually stay super tucked close to the trunk, although I have found a couple. Um, by finding pellets under pines have discovered that well that same way. So um, always fun. And then below that is pretty beautiful owl, arguably um, one of the most beautiful owls, the snowy owl. Um, so this is a photograph of one um, from several years ago at the Indianapolis um, International Airport. We had a couple of them um, there. And they would stay along the runway hunting um, whatever they could find, mice, voles, whatever um, there. And that was when um, I believe the lemming numbers crashed in Canada and we got a humongous influx of snowy owls that year. I believe there was actually a snowy owl that ended up in Bermuda the same year. So um, quite an amazing spectacle to see them this far south, as always. And um, Barn owl is kind of one that I still have yet to photograph in the state. I've seen a number of them, um, but an estate owl uh, would love to see that someday. Burrowing owl, listed as a species that hasn't occurred in the state, 
at least 15 to 20 years. So I'd love to see that boot someday. Moving right along to goals. So I have a particular affinity for goals. A lot of people somewhat get annoyed with goals because the identification of them can be quite difficult, but I find them a lot of fun um, to just kind of pick and sort through. Um, but we have 18 species of goals that have occurred in Indiana, um, two species that have bred in the state. Um, this includes ringbilled and herring um, as the two species that do breed on the lakefront in northern Indiana. Um, other species include Iceland, Great Blackback, the Lesser Blackback, Glaucus, California, Shortbilled, Laughing Franklins, Bonaparte, Black-Headed, Little, Black-Legged Kittywake, and um, Rosses and Sabin's Gull. And so all those species have occurred in Indiana, believe it or not. Um, but one of my favorite on that list has to be the Ross's Gull. Um, Ross's Gulls, have, since I was a kid, I always dreamed of seeing a Ross's Gull. And earlier this winter, um, I had the very unbelievable chance of seeing a Ross's Gull on the border of Indiana and Chicago. Um, um, this on the um, right hand side of the screen is a first cycle, super crisp Ross's Gull. Um, and as soon I had just got done leading a youth birding hike and I had just finished and I got an alert on my phone. In, in front of I got a little bit of the family. They up they were okay with the fact that I uh, had to break a couple ran up there and got it and it flew just kind of aimlessly in the wind. Absolutely incredible species. Bird that less I think something like wild, not a common by any means anywhere in the world. The scene and you know the thing to do with um, happy to get bird. So that was absolutely great. Then moving on to the uh, beautiful adult, um, little gulls that up at Eagle Creek. My part that I work at, the both parts gulls, that's kind of not common out here. So that was amazing to get to see. Full, absolutely white, clean, yelling, dark, dumpy wings. Um, absolutely amazing to see. Uh, then up that, I just want to go with the kind of same theme. Block a skull. So, the that we that holes cannot get done. Hope to see that. Um, the the sound is breaking up at the moment, Aiden. I don't know if it's happening for anybody else, but just to let you know, it's just breaking up a little bit okay. at the moment. Yeah, it, it is, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know why that is, Aiden, yeah. but um, we'll 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 keep you posted how we're how we're how we're receiving you. But if you could yeah. just maybe keep your commentary brief and or very um, sharp, that would be fantastic. And I hope that, that improves it for us at this side of the pond. Yeah, absolutely. Is Sorry this, to interrupt. Is still. Is it still breaking up? No, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely. Sorry about that. No, probably uh, the technical fault. Thank you. That sounds better. Okay, good. Cool. Um, and then um, moving right along, we have black-legged kiwake on the right side of the screen. Uh, first cycle bird right there. Um, gorgeous bird. That is a bird that's on the uh, northern edge of the lake um, in northern Indiana. Um, we get that every winter, um, but always a, a treat to see kitty wakes um, in Indiana. Um, and then on the right hand side, excuse me, left hand side of the screen, um, we have a slaty back gull. That is a Russian um, gull that uh, showed up with a bunch of herring gulls in um, northern Indiana at a, um, that was, I think, at a uh, old refinery but um beautiful beautiful gull right pink legs slaty backed um coloration there and um the string of pearls on those primaries are just amazing um and then we have 
the California gull below it um, is another um, really awesome bird that occasionally graces Indiana, um, pretty rarely, but um, does occur with a couple herring gulls. So that uh, kind of concludes the gulls, but um, amazing group of gulls have shown up in Indiana for that. Moving right along to sparrows. So sparrows and towhees, um, 24 species of sparrow and three species of towhee have occurred in Indiana with 11 species of sparrow breeding and one species um, of towhee breeding in the state. Um, so that includes house sparrows, song sparrows, field sparrows, grasshoppers, henslows, clay colored shipping, savanna and swamp all have bred in the state. Um, and there's a number of rarities that I um, won't go into in too much detail, but um, we've had a lot of pretty amazing sparrows um, in Indiana. Um, the um, left-hand side is a spotted towhee. That was a rare bird that showed up um, for a number of years um, at the same spot in the same seed pile. Um, so that was really cool to have a reoccurring spotted towhee. Um, and then we also had um, on the right side of the screen, um, on the upper right, a beautiful white crowned sparrow. This is a very common species in the winter and um, early spring. Um, we get lots of white crowns, especially in the rural countryside of Indiana. Um, and then below that is a Oregon uh, subspecies of dark-eyed junco. Um, so this is a North American bird um, through and through. There have been juncos in Europe, and I don't think there's ever been Oregon subspecies. I, I would love to know on that. But I a particular affinity for juncos. I've actually started my own Facebook page, um, the Junco Complex on juncos. I, I've met with the uh, world-leading um, expert on juncos and um, have looked at many different taxa of subspecies, trying to determine different subspecies identification on them. But uh, amazing bird. Won't get into the details of that. It's a whole other presentation, but um, amazing bird. Um, and that, that was actually at my backyard um, a number of years ago. So that was pretty amazing to get to see that. that. Um, Oregon juncos, hence the name, are typically more out west and not in Indiana. So that was really nice to get to see for that. So moving on to finches, my particular favorite part of winter is winter finches. Um, 10 species of finch have occurred in Indiana. Three species of finch breed in the state. That includes house finch, American goldfinch, pine siskin. Um, and that's, that's all this, the finches that we get that breed in the state. Um, common and hoary red poles will occasionally um, come to the state in the winter, as well as white winged crossbills, red crossbills, uh, um, and evening and pine grosbeaks occasionally will um, um, go up in the state, and purple finches as well, similar to the halibut. Um, but the um, right side of the screen there is a pine uh, grosbeak. That pine grosbeak is a um, one of the rarest finches that has ever occurred in Indiana. Um, a friend of mine and I um, were just randomly birding the lakeshore a number of years ago, and we ended up stumbling upon, well, I was at the top of a dune, and I heard a bird that sounded eerily like a pine grosbeak, but no pine grosbeaks had been reported south of Wisconsin or Michigan um, in that year. So this would have been the furthest south pine grosbeak um, and no, a number of years, I think it was like maybe eight to um, 10 years. Um, and lo and behold, it was a pine grosbeak and we tracked it down, got amazing photos of it. Um, we're one of the only people in Indiana to have gotten to see a pine grosbeak. So that was a really incredible honor um, to get to see that bird um, in, in Indiana. Um, and then on the right side of the screen, um, excuse me, left side of the screen, upper right, we have a two bar crossbill or white wing crossbill. Um, absolutely amazing bird. Um, love crossbills. It's actually a good year for them, apparently, pushing southward in North America. I'm not sure what um, the home conditions are in Europe, but it should be a really good year for white winged crossbill in North America, um, at least if it's what they are predicting based on the tone crop in Canada. Um, so hopefully, we see a, a few of those this year. And below that is my favorite finch of all, uh, evening grosbeak. And I talked a little about them early on, um, but absolutely incredible bird. Um, and I got to photograph that um, earlier 
this winter, uh, so past winter um, in southern Indiana. Um, so that was really incredible. Heard that. So moving right along to spring. So um, this includes March and May. So uh, we're going to go over warblers, thrushes, flycatchers, kingbirds, phoebes, vireos, cuckoos, tanagers, shorebirds, and rails. Um, and I'll try to be pretty concise on all these. Um, but this is a photo of a Wilson saddle rope um, taking off there. Um, and a very spring shorebird that shows up in the state. Um, so we'll get started right here. So probably the most popular of the spring are the very flashy um, spring warblers. So 39 species of warbler have occurred in Indiana. Uh, 13 species of warbler breed in the state. Um, there's a huge list of warblers. I really don't want to read off all of those, but you feel free to read them um, at your leisure. Um, about of those 13 species that breed in the state, black thirty green, prairie, pine, yellow, Cystocytid worm-eating Kentucky, northern parilla, Louisiana water thrush, yellow throat warbler, common yellow throat, cerulean warbler, black and white, oven bird, and black burning, and all breed in the state. Um, but with a number of rarities um, mixed in there as well. Um, but spring is easily my favorite time to bird in Indiana, uh, just for the sheer beauty of a lot of the um, alternate plumage birds. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we have one of the most gorgeous warblers, the Black Burnian warbler, um, famous for their just absolutely fiery throat. Um, so super dark orange throat, orange head, um, yellow wash on that uh, the belly and white wing patch there and black on the um, um, back of the bird there. Um, but that bird was super obliging. It had dropped down in a, a honeysuckle bush just right next to me, right at eye level, and I got that shot, and that was very lucky. They're usually canopy birds, so that was awesome. Um, and then on the right side of the screen, upper right side, we have a black bird, a blue warbler, um, absolutely gorgeous bird, um, bright blue back, white wing there, uh, very flashy. And then my personal favorite warbler, the Connecticut warbler, um, below that, the bottom uh, right-hand corner, um, that is my best photo, I think, hard to top of a Connecticut warbler. Um, I was very happy to get that this past spring. Um, they love to skulk. So they are the top skulkers. Uh, they will be walking on the forest floor um, and um, just incredible, very shy, recluse-like warblers, almost like thrushes. Um, but that was, I just love how their recluse-like behavior and um, find them absolutely striking. So when I get to see them, they're just gorgeous birds. Um, so that was truly amazing to get to see. Um, so that is a big highlight of spring. So moving right along into thrushes. Seven species of thrush have occurred in Indiana with three species of thrush breeding in the state. This includes American Robin, Wood Thrush, and Beery, um, with Hermit, Swainson's, and Gray Cheeked. Um, coming annually, and the varied thrush being the rarity. Um, so on the right-hand side of the screen is a, a gorgeous um, varied thrush that showed up a number of years ago. I was had the fortune of getting to see this beautiful male. It was my first varied thrush. Uh, it's one of my favorite North American species that I've ever seen. Um, absolutely striking bird. Um, can't miss it. I know a number of them have showed up in Europe, um, believe it or not, um, shockingly even though they are Pacific Northwest species. So um, absolutely incredible birds. And then on the uh, upper left-hand corner, a wood thrush, another um, trademark species of the Eastern forest. Um, they breed at the park I work at, Eagle Creek. So that was always a treat to hear them in the summer and um, in the spring. Um, and then a gray cheek thrush underneath that. That covers thrushes. And then, Flycatchers. So, um, flycatchers, uh, we have about 11 species of flycatchers, three species of kingbird, and two species of phoebe that have occurred in the state. Um, and it's pretty um, incredible. Um, about six species of flycatcher, one species of phoebe, and two species of kingbird breed in the state. Um, so, um, pretty incredible stuff. 
of those breeders, we have leaf flycatcher, alder flycatcher, willow flycatcher, crested, eastern wood peewee, Acadian, um, eastern phoebe, eastern kingbird, and western kingbird, all breed in Indiana. Um, and on the left-hand side, a beautiful vermilion flycatcher, a rarity in Indiana. I got to see that um, a couple years ago in the spring. Um, just absolutely striking bird. Cannot miss it from the Mexico and uh, southern states of um, North America. On the right side, we have a beautiful olive-sided flycatcher, my favorite flycatcher. Um, I believe it should be renamed to olive-sided peewee um, because they are actually a peewee and not really a flycatcher, but can't have them all. I'm very happy um, to see that guy um, at a local birding spot that I go to on private property. And then below that is a trails flycatcher or alder flycatcher because I heard it call, so I was able to confirm it was an alder uh, there. But awesome birds. Very happy to see flycatchers, especially in the spring. Um, moving right along to a couple other photos. This is a fork tail flycatcher. The long tail flycatcher here on the left hand side or right hand side. Uh, these, this bird showed up in, um, well, I think it was last year. Um, and this was actually in fall, but we have had spring records of fork tails. This is a bird that should be in Brazil, um, but showed up in the lake shore of Indiana. Absolutely incredible bird with that fork tail. Um, just one of the most striking uh, flycatchers I've ever seen. Um, so that was a treat to get to see that. Um, and then on the left-hand side, we have Eastern Phoebe sitting on um, the wire there, um, the brown bird. And then below it is a Western Kingbird, um, another breeder in the state for that. But love flycatchers. I cannot get enough of them. Um, amazing birds. Moving to videos, we have about seven species of vireos that have occurred in Indiana. Five species of vireo that breed in the state. Um, Yellow-throated, white-eyed, bells, red-eyed, and warbling all breed in the state. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen, a bells vireo. This is a new nester to the state. Not typical historic records um, show that I think the first bells vireo started nesting in the early 80s in Indiana. Um, but they are kind of a wet, marshy habitat bird um, from the interior west. Um, some more Western species, but have kind of creeped into Indiana in terms of breeders. Um, and then on the left side, a beautiful yellow-throated vireo. Um, really incredible bird singing from the treetops in the summer. You'll hear their beautiful songs um, in uh, most summer and spring days um, in Indiana. And then below that is a Philadelphia vireo. Um, this is a bird that the only vireo um, next to blue-headed that has not bred in the state. Um, Blue-headed, again, historically, potentially a bred in the state, but not confirmed. Um, so Philadelphia vireos are really cool. They're boreal forest vireo, um, and they only come down here in spring migration in fall. So really awesome for that. Moving to cuckoos. So new world cuckoos, different than the um, old world cuckoos that you guys are very used to. Um, so two species of cuckoo have occurred in Indiana, which includes black-billed and yellow-billed. And they both um, breed in the state, and they both actually have bred in Eagle Creek, the park that I work at in Indianapolis. Um, so on the left-hand side, this is an amazing photo I was, managed to get. Um, it was this past summer, um, I'll, just on the um, outside of my center, I was able to get this photo. Um, at eye level, um, very unusual for a cuckoo, but it flew as soon as I took the shot, at about one shot, and that was it. Um, but got that beautiful red orbital ring and blue bill. And then the yellow bill cuckoo has that yellow bill and the circular discs on the underside of the tail. Um, but beautiful birds. Um, they do not parasitize like the old world cuckoos. Um, so kind of different in that regard, but similar anatomically and vocally. Moving to tanagers. So three species of tanager have occurred in Indiana, two of which breed in the state. Scarlet tanager and um, that should be summer tanager, that was my bad, um, and western tanager um, all breed in the state. 
Um, so the center image is a scarlet tanager um, with the black wings. Um, so that was an awesome opportunity. I was able to photograph that bird at eye level um, in years ago, 2016. Um, and then the upper right-hand corner is a summer tanager. Um, that is an all red tanager. They molt from green to red um, in the summer, um, but mostly summer and spring species um, for that. And then another photo of a scarlet tanager. Um, don't have any photos of the Western tanager, although I have seen one in Indiana for that. Moving on to shorebird species, I will not read all those shorebirds. But we have had a lot of shorebirds in Indiana. 37 species have occurred in Indiana with eight of those um, breeding. Of the breeding species, you have killdeer, Wilson's fowl rope, Wilson's snipe, American woodcock, piping clover, upland sandpiper, spotted sandpiper, and black neck stilt. Shorebirds are probably my personal favorite um, of the springtime. I love their beautiful, vibrant plumages, and they're just Characteristics and personality are just absolutely amazing. Um, so on the left side is a really gorgeous Wilson's fowl rope that a uh, female, so uh, as some of you might know, female fowl ropes tend to be the more brighter of uh, the sexes. Uh, male fowl ropes are way more dull. This is a beautiful adult female Wilson's fowl rope um, that showed up at a flooded yard, believe it or not, we should say literal flooded pond outside of someone's property that they were graciously enough to let birders come by and see. Um, but beautiful bird for that. Um, and then on the right side, we have a Hudsonian godwit um, and breeding plumage. Absolutely incredible flyer all the way from, you know, they migrate from Alaska all the way to about southern tip of South America. Um, incredible migration that these guys make. Um, so that was incredible to get to see that bird in breeding plumage in the spring. Below that, a red-necked fowl rope, another adult female, um, just very vibrant plumage. That was this past spring at a flooded um, agricultural site. That was really awesome. Quite a treat to get to see. Um, but feel free to read the list of shorebirds there. Um, we've had a number of Asian species, including lesser sand clover, uh, spotted red shanks, sharp-tailed sandpiper, um, black-tailed godwit. Um, so pretty incredible for Indiana to have those birds. Um, you would never have thought. But shorebirds are some of the strongest flyers of any birds out there. So it makes total sense for them to have made such um, flights. If any bird's going to do it, it'll be them. Moving to rails. So five species of rails have occurred in Indiana. Uh, three species of rail breed in the state. Um, this includes king rail, sora, and Virginia rail, um, with black rail and yellow rail being the very elusive, hard to find rails um, that have occurred. So on the left-hand side, we have a beautiful cooperative and quite territorial king rail. Um, this is at a breeding site, um, and I got to see that. Um, that was an amazing bird, um, just kind of, coming straight out from the reeds, calling there. Um, and then on the right side, a Sora, um, so similar to some of the crakes you guys have in Europe. Um, probably the most common rail that we get in Indiana is Sora. Um, and then the next most common is Virginia rail, which is the bottom photo. Um, but both species of rails, King, uh, Sora, and Virginia, um, again, all breed in Indiana. Um, and I'm working currently on a project in Eagle Creek to reintroduce king rails um, to the park. So I'm hoping to change some habitat and manage habitat so that I can promote um, that uh, king rails back in the park where they haven't bred in the park for 25 years. So it would be quite a feat if I can do it, but I think I can. So I'm really hoping on achieving that goal um, at my park and I'd love to see these guys come back. Moving right along to summer. So um, summer includes whistling ducks, um, wading birds, shorebirds, raptors, and hummingbirds. Um, but I wanted to include some whistling ducks here. So um, these ducks really only occur in the summer months for whatever reason. Um, we've had them in other months, mostly summer months. 
Um, this is a black-bellied whistling duck pair. And believe it or not, these birds are now breeding in Indiana. This used to be a strictly southern species only, but now they are breeding in Indiana. Um, so black-bellied whistling duck there with that beautiful red bill. And then on the right-hand corner, um, we have a fulvous whistling duck from the Falls of the Ohio that I was able to see um, about two years ago for that. Moving right along to wading birds. So about uh, four species of egret, three species of ibis, five species of heron, one species of spoonbill, one species of stork, limpkin, two species of bittern, and one species of flamingo have occurred in Indiana. Um, so lots of wading birds have occurred in Indiana, believe it or not. Uh, seven species of wading bird have bred in the state. This includes great blue herons, great egrets, black crown night herons, yellow crown night herons, green herons, American bitterns, and least bittern. Um, with rarities including reddish egrets, tricolored herons, stork, wood storks, white ibis, limpkin, and American flamingo. And we'll get to that flamingo in a second. But on the left hand side, we have a beautiful tricolored heron. Um, we just added an additional tricolored heron to the park. This was not from um, Eagle Creek, but um, we just had a tricolored heron in the park not too long ago. So that was quite exciting. On the right-hand side, a beautiful little blue heron and beautiful striking summer plumage, that blue bill, purple plumage, and blue body. And then below it, a glossy ibis, um, which is, I think, the only ibis species that you guys might be familiar with out there. Um, but that was quite incredible to get to see for that. So moving right along to the star of the show, in my opinion, the American flamingo. So I don't know if you guys have been listening to a lot of North American reports, but or I think it's over 11 states now have had American flamingos um, occur in them um, due to Hurricane Adalia that hit the Florida coast about two weeks ago, or about well now three weeks ago. Um, and these American flamingos have been completely displaced into the U.S. Um, and luckily, Indiana just got its first flamingo about two weeks ago um, on the border of Kentucky and Illinois, or Kentucky and Indiana, um, I kayaked out to the Flamingo with a friend of mine, and we were able to watch it at a safe distance and get some pretty incredible photos of it. Um, but I never would have dreamed in a thousand years that I'd be seeing an American Flamingo in Indiana. Um, so there it was. Um, absolutely gorgeous bird. Um, Caribbean, mostly they breed in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, so very, very far, of course, um, it's still there. Hopefully it survives the winter. Um, some birds have even started heading south. Um, so who knows, very tough to say, um, but that was quite an unexpected bird. Um, and Lincoln is the next kind of unexpected bird that has occurred in Indiana. We have now had, I believe something crazy over 21 records of Lincolns in Indiana. So that's 21 limpkins, and that is a species that only ever occurred in Florida. So if you know you don't believe in climate change, I think that could be something that might be contributing to um, these birds being displaced due to uh, raising temperatures on their native ground. Um, unbelievable bird you get to see. Um, that is one of the first limpkins that ever showed up in Indiana. I got to see that um, in southern Indiana. And then below that, a wood stork, which I've only seen one of in the state. Um, but we have had occur in the state. And then shorebird species, we have um, willets um, on the upper um, left-hand side of the screen here, um, an American willet or Eastern willet. Uh, that is the same species that the peregrine falcon attacked in the earlier slides. Um, but we get a number of summer uh, shorebird species, mostly large shorebirds like these, so willets, godwits, and avocets. Um, so that is a, a western willet, um, excuse me, um, not a eastern willet. Eastern willets stay on the coast. Western willets go inland to the Great Lakes, so the western willet. Below it is a marbled godwit. And then on the right side of the screen, my one of my personal favorites, an American avocet. Um, and that was recently taken that photo um, in Indianapolis um, this past, I guess, summer, so um, not too long ago. Um, but absolutely incredible um, birds. Um, we have had 
a number of good shorebirds show up kind of at the start of the fall, um, but this is kind of the tip of the iceberg for that. And then kites. Um, we have a number of species of kites that have showed up. So three species of kites in the state have occurred. This includes swallowtail kite, Mississippi kite, and whitetail kite. Um, and one of those breed in the state, and that is Mississippi kite. Uh, all kites only occur in the summer, um, do not occur in any other time of the year, um, with the exception maybe of uh, late spring. Um, but yes, so that is really awesome to get to see some kites in the state. Um, my absolute favorite, one of my absolute favorite raptors is swallowtail kite. It's pictured on the left-hand side, absolute gorgeous bird with that forked tail, um, very elegant birds. I'm seeing a number of them in the state. And then on the uh, right-hand side, two Mississippi kites. The bottom is a juvenile Mississippi kite, um, but Mississippi kites are quite cool birds. Um, we have had now a number of them recently uh, nesting in Indianapolis, another new phenomenon that used to be more further south. So um, pretty amazing to get to um, see them nest this far north. Moving on to hummingbird species. So um, in the, uh, we have had six species of hummingbirds that have occurred in Indiana, um, of which we've had um, about uh, one species that breeds in the state. So that is ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, all the other ones are pretty rare um, that have occurred. Rubus hummingbird being the only one that somewhat occurs annually. Um, very, um, it's not too too common to get them, but we do get them. Um, so on the right hand side of the screen is a beautiful adult um, Rupus hummingbird that showed up at a feeder um, last year, um, and that was really incredible to get to see them. Um, for that. Um, and then the calliope hummingbird is the bird on the uh, upper um, left-hand side of the screen. That was actually one of the only calliope hummingbirds that's ever occurred in the state. And I had the very lucky opportunity to get to see that bird. Um, unfortunately, not many others got to see that bird. That was, I did not realize at the time, I was with a very well-versed birder in Indiana. And he said, you know, you can't tell anybody about this record. It was one of those birds. And I was very young. And of course, I wasn't going to deny going to see a rarity. So I went to see it. But unfortunately, he closed visitation shortly after that. But I was very lucky to have gotten to see that bird. Um, incredible species there. And then below it is the most common hummingbird species, the ruby-throated hummingbird for that. And then moving right along to fall birding. Um, so fall, we have warblers, yeggers, and gulls, shorebirds, and sparrows to end the presentation here. Um, so we'll get started here. This is a photo of a rupt grouse that actually was photographed in the fall in one of the state forests. It's a species that's basically extinct in Indiana down to maybe less than 10 individuals. I was lucky enough to get to see this particular individual here. Um, very, 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 very hard species to find in Indiana when I was lucky enough. This bird actually came super close. It was picking up at my shoelaces, acting like it was a literal chicken. Um, it was very suspicious of the fact that this bird was wild, but I've read that this is actually quite a common occurrence with birds that have not been exposed to humans. So I believe this bird was just so not attuned to humans that it was very tame. But that was really ni uh, nice to get to add that to my Indiana list and get to see such a, um, a relic species. Straight into fall warblers. So unfortunately, they've lost their beautiful, vibrant colors in spring and have um, kind of had more muted tones. Um, but we get the same amount of warblers that we usually do in the spring that we do in the fall. On the left-hand side is a Connecticut warbler. And again, my favorite warbler. Um, this is a um, particular individual was found in uh, downtown Indy. Uh, might have been a window strike, um, but seemed to be okay. Was hunting on the ground right outside this building. Got pretty incredible photos of that. Um, and then on the right-hand side, upper right-hand side, a bay-breasted warbler. Um, I believe a couple have shown up recently in your neck of the woods. Pretty incredible bird. Um, I 
skin a, a boreal forest nester as well as all the warblers really that occur um, in the state. And then um, a orange crowned warbler is the bird underneath the bay breasted. This is a fall only warbler. So we do get orange crowns in the spring, but more often than not, orange crowns are way more common in the fall than they are in the spring. And I believe that has to do with a slight change in migration route they take in the fall. Um, so pretty awesome to get to see them in the fall. Pretty drab bird, but also just really fun to get to see that bird. Um, I'd say they're pretty, but that's just me. Um, and then moving on to Yeggers and gulls. So in this uh, fall, a few gull species occur in the state. So we have about, um, again, 19 species of gull that have occurred in the state. Um, I would say really two gulls stick out to me as being fall only, and that's Sabin's gulls and Franklin's gulls. Um, for whatever reason, we get most of our Sabin's gulls in Indiana in the fall, um, and we get absolutely our most Franklin's gulls in the fall. Um, and that is due to their westerly migration um, versus their more central migration in the spring. For um, the right-hand side of the uh, screen, that is a um, non-breeding Sabin's gull that showed up at Eagle Creek. I was lucky enough to paddle to that bird. Um, I actually was also lucky enough to hold um, the record, the state high count of Sabin's gulls. I believe we had over 150 Sabin's gulls fly by the Indiana Lakeshore um, one fall. So love those birds, absolutely gorgeous wings on those birds. Um, and then the top left-hand corner is a parasitic Jaeger. We have about three species of Jaeger that have occurred in the uh, state or skua, I guess, out in Europe. Um, so long-tailed skua, pomeranian skua, and parasitic skua, um, or um, arctic skua, I believe is what it would be called. Um, but parasitic is easily the most common um, that we get out in the fall here. And then the Franklin's gall is probably the next most common gall that we get in the fall. Um, but really awesome birds for that. Um, always fun to see in the fall. And then fall shorebirds, can't go wrong with shorebirds again. Um, on the right side of the screen, we have a buff-breasted sandpiper. I photographed that boy at uh, Eagle Creek. Um, it was a young bird. I got super close to it um, at a safe distance from my kayak, got that shot, was quite happy with that. Um, beautiful, beautiful bird, um, again, um, they're a high arctic breeder and they migrate southward in the fall. We get lots more of them in the fall than we do in the spring. Um, and then upper left-hand corner is a western sandpiper, another one that just showed up at Eagle Creek um, not too long ago that I got to photograph um, as well out there on the mudflats. And then below it is a purple sandpiper, so pretty familiar shorebird probably for you guys in Europe, um, but absolutely astonishing bird with those beautiful purple chevrons. Um, I got to see that on the Indiana Lakeshore just along the lakefront. And that is the, probably the most hardy shorebird species that we have in the state. They will occur all the way through winter, straight from January all the way until March. Um, so very hardy species, um, incredible birds, diving all those waves, incredible. And then fall sparrows. So. Sparrows and towhees again. Um, we mostly um, get all the sparrows in the fall. We get most of our sparrows in the fall, um, in fact. Um, so most of the sparrows on that list you will see in the fall, um, with the exception of a few. Um, but from the left, um, that is a Nelson sparrow. That is my personal favorite sparrow. Absolutely gorgeous bird. I've been looking for this bird nonstop this past week. Um, just because this is about peak time for them. Um, kind of recluse-like birds. Um, they tend to hide in the willows, um, stay very hidden, but this one popped out, and I was lucky to get a really nice shot of them. Um, and then on the right side of the screen, a similar bird, a Leconte sparrow. I talked a little about them earlier. Um, another absolutely gorgeous um, sparrow that is a fall-only really bird. And then below it, a lark sparrow, another one that breeds in the state that we have seen in the fall and spring. Um, so they're kind of around all the time, but I figured I'd throw it in here just because absolutely gorgeous bird. Um, I never get tired of seeing them over that. 
Well, thank you guys so much for listening. That was a lot, um, but I hope you guys felt like you learned a little bit about Indiana birding, and um, I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you guys so much. Oh, thank, thank you very, very much, Aiden. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, great. Oh, thank you. That was a real tour de force. Thank you so much. Um, I'm quite sure there'll be some questions if you're happy to answer them. If you've still got any voice left, that would be great. Um, Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, so may I open uh, questioning open to everybody? Any questions out there? Aiden. Hi, Aiden. Uh, brilliant talk. Great photography. Uh, some from fantastic shots there. Uh, and just at the end there, I loved your buff breasted sand shot where you actually managed to get the upper wing and the under wing in the same shot. So that's uh, quite a rarity. But I, I noticed you said that you do quite a bit of birding and photography from your kayak. Um, I mean, how do you have like a waterproof sack to sort of keep your camera in? And have you ever had any close shaves of your camera going in the water? Because that would probably scare the living daylights out of me. So I actually, I kind of, um, I have a backpack that is somewhat waterproof um, and I stick my camera in there, zip it. And only when I am close to the bird and within range of the bird, will I unzip it and um, take the shots. But it always is in that bag because God forbid, you know, a, a wave hits me or whatever, or, you know, I beach myself or something happens. Uh, that would be quite catastrophic. So I highly suggest getting that. I'm actually looking into getting, there's something you can put on your lens that is like a uh, the waterproof, like basically jostring bag that you can just kind of tighten to your lens. And it um, goes over your camera too. It's like a hood uh, that you can zip up. And I, I think that'd be a lot more practical than having a book bag. But um, book bag has seemed to work, a waterproof bag. <laughs> Hey, so, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for Aiden? Aiden, I, I, I was very interested to hear you say about the expansion of birds from the south, like the whistling duck, you know, the, obviously the flamingo and, and the limpkin. Those are extraordinary steps northwards. Um, are they mimicked by any of the smaller passerine species? So I, I think a lot of those um, more coastal species are way more influenced by um, kind of available resources in their current range. So it um, could be that the populations, uh, the flamingos were storm related. So that was probably purely storm related, but limpkins and whistling ducks, I would suggest uh, it could be um, nesting habitat within Florida and the Gulf Coast is maybe getting too tight because their population is booming so much. So it's almost like they're, they're um, producing too much and having too little area to breed. So they are yeah. just pushing northward, potentially uh, colonizing. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm sure you're the grateful recipients of, of that uh, expansion. And tell, tell Absolutely. us- Tell us a bit more about your work with the king rails, because that sounds very interesting. It's a, a grand species of rail. Fantastic. It's a absolutely incredible bird. So I um, am currently starting, there's a, there's a section of the park uh, that is currently, has two ponds on it. Um, and historically, one of those ponds had, um, it was pretty um, expansive and it was a nice wetland habitat. But over the years, the managers in the park Kind of let it go um, and grow up and kind of um, they there's a lot of undergrowth species that shouldn't be there invasive species that have taken over um, mm -hmm. so my thought after reviewing the area and creating a management plan i propose this to uh, the park staff and the city um, my plan is to um, remove some of the tiles in the field um, and let some water go back into that field mm -hmm. um, get rid of some of the saplings and um, basically um, return to the area to a natural wetland like it was. Um, and about 25 years ago, uh, King Rails did breed, not in that particular section of the park, but in another section, a smaller wetland. So 
So if they bred in a smaller wetland of that park, uh, section of the park, I, I have no doubt that they will assuredly come back if the habitat's there. So I think that's my, my one step that I'm going to try and push for. That's a great plan, very ambitious. I hope you get you know the support you need for, for doing that. Be very exciting. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, maybe. Any other questions this evening? I think perhaps that reflects how much information you you've given us tonight, Aidan. As I said, it was a it was a tour de force uh, in terms of the coverage and the information and the images. Uh, fantastic. I mean, your experience and knowledge really shone through. And as Steve said, the photographic standard was fantastic um, to get so many species, also many of them in different seasonal plumages was was wonderful so many of them really stood out i mean that your uh, american long eared owl wow with those uh, lovely buff facial discs um the little northern saw wet owl is as you said super cute uh, and i imagine it's got a, a, an attractive call to go with it and then just the colorful grosbeaks and blackburnian warblers and that variety of fly catchers um, even touching on, on hummingbirds. There were a lot of birds there that I think were really struck a chord with people. Um, some of them because they're such rarities in this country and others, but yeah, because they've got such great stories to tell about migration on your continent and to compare it with migrations on our continent. Um, one of the ones that, that really struck me was that fantastic picture of Redneck Phalarope and particularly, uh, sorry, um, Wilson's Phalarope. And particularly the circumstances that you found it in, because uh, recently uh, one or two members locally have enjoyed what we call grey phalarope, I think it's your red phalarope, um, dibbling around in a, a pavement pond uh, in a coastal town not far away from here, just oblivious to passers-by uh, in the most unnatural of habitats. But there we are, en route to somewhere further south from somewhere much further north. Incredible journeys. and incredible moments in time when, when you see them and the fact you were there with your camera means that you know it's there for eternity and, and we've enjoyed those moments with you this evening which you very lucidly and vividly spoke to us about it's, it's one thing seeing a picture but it adds to it so much when you tell us the circumstances and clearly from your point of view you put in a huge amount of effort to get to see these birds and get the best shots uh, possible and we, we really appreciate it those really in the know will have really enjoyed your detailed description of, of differences between the birds and just having that opportunity to see them well illustrated tonight just adds so so much to it. Um, I think it's been so appropriate this evening that our first talk has come from the States since we've had this unprecedented influx of Yankee birds into Wales in, in the last few weeks and many of us will have no doubt um, wondered where they come from. And we've seen uh, where they've come from this evening, or at least some of them. And you, you've really put um, Illinois on the map for us, because I suspect if many of the listeners and, and watchers this evening like me, and Illinois is perhaps not a headline state in terms of what we know about the United States, but you clearly uh, put us in the know tonight. It is a fantastic state for avian diversity and no doubt other wildlife too. And I love the way you did it in that nice, gentle, seasonal way, drawing us through the year and making us feel as part of your bird watching year as, as we possibly could be. And yet we're 8,000 kilometers away from you. Uh, you've managed to do that. So congratulations. I think we, we feel we've been with you in a, a birding year in, in in Illinois, in Indiana, I beg your pardon. Um, I'm sure many of us will be really so keen to get over and see it for ourselves um, and other parts of the state. Uh, but thank you for a wonderful introduction this evening. It couldn't have been better. And it's got our program off to an excellent start. Thank you for your time, not just this evening or your afternoon, but all the hours and hours of field work, photographic editing, Putting a talk like this together takes a long time uh, and we really appreciate your effort. We've been very privileged tonight, Aidan, 
good luck with your work at uh, Eagle Creek. I'm sure if all of your presentations are as good as tonight, then locals over there are much indebted to you uh, and uh, enjoy a treat every time you are there to lead them. Thank you very much indeed. Yahweh as we say. Thank you so much. Okay.